Good morning and welcome everybody. I've uh, just started the recording of this lecture. So let's take a moment to pray together and uh, we will get started. Okay, could somebody please lead us in prayer that we will start. All right, Aaron, would you like to pray with us and we'll start? Yeah, sure, Pastor. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for this day of learning once again, Lord. Lord, as we learn more, Lord, we depend on you and we trust you completely. So, Spirit of God, come and awaken our hearts with your living word. So, I submit all the rest of the glasses into your loving hand. Amen. Amen. All right. Sorry. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, so this week, we have been talking about volunteer management, how to, um, you know, how to work with volunteers, uh, just some practical things, uh, things to think about uh, in the church or in any Christian organization, because uh, uh, a lot of the work is actually uh, done through the help of the volunteers. So just some uh, practical learnings, things that we can do to make this whole process easy, uh, good, uh, especially when the, the staff who are part of the church or the Christian organization uh, work with the volunteers. Everything should go well. And so we just, you know, talking about different aspects of that. So I'm going to go ahead and share the uh, PDF on my screen, and then we will quickly review. Uh, we'll go forward, uh, complete this, and then, uh, you know, if you have any questions, discussions, ideas, we'll try to keep uh, some time towards the end to uh, engage in that. So just a quickly review. Uh, we started talking about this on Wednesday. Uh, volunteers, they offer their time uh, freely, uh, energy and skills. So, but we need to think through on how to, you know, uh, engage with them correctly, meaningfully. Of course, we know there are a lot of benefits when volunteers uh, serve in the church or any Christian organization. We are aware of the limitations. You know, they offer only a little bit of the time. They may have other priorities uh, and so on. Now, we started talking about, uh, you know, the volunteer teams. Uh, we need to have uh, teams for various areas of work or ministry. And uh, I, I just shared a little bit of uh, like what happens here at uh, the church at APC. Uh, we have different groups uh, or other teams uh, that serve on Sundays. So all of these people, uh, most people, in many of these areas are all volunteers. We do have staff who would be engaged in certain areas. Uh, similarly with ministry teams, these people, these teams are involved in ministries uh, which could happen during the week, uh, not just on a Sunday service, but during the week, uh, these kinds of ministries happen and volunteers are also involved there. So uh, we looked at this model uh, where uh, it's a very useful model where uh, we can have staff and the volunteers engaged in various areas of ministries. And these kinds of teams can be created quickly and easily as and when the need arises. So we started talking also about, we started talking about volunteer recruitment. You know, how do you get people to come in and help uh, volunteer in the church or in the Christian organization? Uh, there are different things that we can do and uh, one of the most effective ways uh, I had mentioned was, uh, you know, personal contact. Just call people, ask, ask them personally. Most often they would say yes. Um, and of course, you can do other things. You can make Sunday announcements. You can have sign up uh, on online sign up. You can have special Sundays where you have uh, special drives, uh, making people aware of uh, all the opportunities that are there. Uh, you can have people share testimonies. 
and I also shared, you know, how we uh, use the VIP banquet, the uh, the a special lunch that uh, we have for new people in church. We use that as a time to also inform them about uh, uh, volunteering, serving in church, and giving them the opportunity to sign up uh, if they would like to. And uh, of course, once uh, volunteers sign up, uh, very important is to engage with them immediately. If we uh, don't uh, get back to them, you know, uh, very quickly, they'll think like, okay, these guys are not interested. Uh, 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 and they, they also may lose interest or they may change their minds. So uh, in this process of enlisting volunteers, it's good to uh, be very responsive uh, to them when they show interest, uh, engage them and get them on board as soon as possible. Now, in some, uh, so we'll start from here today. In some uh, areas of ministry, uh, uh, we do have, you know, uh, uh, a formal, uh, I would say, some sort of a formal interview or audition or review process. Uh, some areas it's easy, you know, you could uh, you can work with anyone, but in some areas of ministry we have this. For, for example, in uh, worship team, you know, because uh, uh, this their skill has to be. Uh, checked that you know we want to maintain a certain standard in the worship team so we have a formal audition process so we say okay you want to volunteer you want to serve in the worship team you have to come for the audition you come prepared and people you know there will be people who will test your skills and if you do well and you're up to the mark then only then you can volunteer so uh, that is fine wherever wherever you know in whichever team that is required we have to uh, we definitely need people who have certain skills before you can do that in some areas it's more of a willingness that's need, needed you know you're willing to come like example in a sunday service we want to be a greeter uh, other than being friendly and warm and you know welcoming people there's nothing much else so anybody can you know, come up, just show up on time and be a greeter and, you know, just greet people as they come to church. Uh, there's not much of an interview there that's required, but in other you know, areas, you will have to have this. Now, once we, uh, once we, uh, uh, you know, have these volunteer teams, one of the things we have done is um, we've tried to document, um, you know, for various teams, um, you know the 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 process involved uh, and what has to be done. Right? So, for example, book table. Okay, what what does the book table have to do? You know, what do we expect? So, you try to document that. Some of this is available in the guidelines, and uh, we need to you know write up uh, for uh, all areas. But I think we've been keeping up with some. Uh, so you document it. You know, what is uh, you know uh, what does each person in the team uh, have to do have to be responsible for so we need to clearly state the tasks that need to be performed what's the knowledge and abilities that are required uh, what are some of the policies and guidelines that need to be followed um, and uh, you know if there's any reporting and accountability that's that's needed so everything has to be documented so example book table okay we have volunteers at the book table we have one person responsible for the book table if the count of the books go down that person needs to get in touch with the church office and inform that you know we need a supply of books so that kind of a reporting has to happen uh, that stock has to be managed and so on so all of this has to be documented and uh, okay so what are our policies you know in our book table we are only keeping our books we don't let you know, people just come and put any kind of books. Only our books are there. Uh, we don't sell our books. The, all our books are for free. If anybody wants to make a contribution, it goes in as an offering to the church. So these are our policies. These are our guidelines. Uh, all these things are documented. So then the volunteers who are serving at the book table know clearly, okay, this is how I run the book table every Sunday. Uh, I'm just using that as a very simple example. But like that, for the different teams that you have, it's good to write it down, make it very clear, and share it with uh, the people who are going to be volunteering in that area. So all of this is in as part of the recruitment. You know, that means you're getting people involved in the volunteers. 
Uh, another very important part that we have to keep in mind, uh, especially from a local church uh, point of view, is demographics. And uh, you know, this, these volunteer teams that we put together are actually a great opportunity to bring people together from uh, different ages, backgrounds to volunteer. In many of these volunteer teams, you can actually bring them together. And in some, some cases you cannot because of the uh, requirements, you know, if, uh, you know, for example, in, in the setup team, if you need to be carrying heavy things, you know, heavy equipment, you cannot have uh, elderly people do that. Or, you know, so there are certain limitations, but in many other teams, it's a great opportunity to bring all these people together. Now, in a church setting, this is very important. You know, one of the things, challenges we went through as a church, uh, and uh, I'm trying to think which year was this, but I, I, I think it was between 2008 to 2011, that three year period, um, what we started noticing was there was a big gap. You know, there were young people, there were the youth, and then there were older people in church. And it seemed like, you know, uh, you know, we all came to the same church, but for some reason there was this big gap. The young people, you know, seemed to be in their own world. And uh, the people, you know, over uh, 35 plus, it's like they were disconnected from what the youth were doing. And this was becoming a big problem in the church, meaning it was not like causing conflict, but it seemed like you were ministering to two different groups of people in sitting in the same congregation and uh, it seemed like there were two sets of services over you'll have all the youth go out and do their own thing and you know the older people by themselves and it's like hey we're not together here and so how you know we had during that time uh, we had to think like what what can we do to bring to bridge this gap you know between the generations and one of the things we did uh, was we started off family Sundays. Uh, so this was Sundays. Uh, I think it was, uh, I forget at what frequency we, frequency we did it, but uh, these were Sundays where people would stay. I think initially we started off with once a month. Uh, people would stay back and we'll do things together. So there would be games that were done together. There would, of course, we'll all have lunch together. We'll do games and activities together. and. Uh, this whole thing was volunteer driven, meaning volunteers will come together. So that means even in organizing the games and participation in the games, we would we would intentionally bring, you know, people across age groups to do these things together. And the whole thought behind that family Sundays was, hey, we need to deal with this issue in the church, the, 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 this divide that we are seeing. We need to get these generations to begin to you know, work together, understand each other and so on. And so that really helped uh, when we ran those family Sundays, you know, over that uh, several years we did it. Uh, and, you know, there was fun times people just do, it was just fun activities, but, you know, people had to do it together. So it kind of helped bridge, uh, get people together, right? So uh, we had to keep thinking about this demographics. Now I'm just shifting over to the second part of this, uh, PDF here. Yeah. Uh, so you create opportunities for all backgrounds to volunteer. And uh, as you're bringing these uh, people uh, together, people from different age groups, you know, uh, we must understand that uh, uh, people from different backgrounds, um, uh, I mean, especially when you talk about age categories, you know, each, uh, each generation, they have their own way of thinking, uh, uh, their own way of looking at life and so on. And so um, we don't want that to isolate people from each other. We want to bring them together. And so uh, we want, you know, so as part of that whole volunteering, bringing these teams together, uh, wherever possible, bring these people and highlight uh, the strengths that they bring, you know, okay, say, hey, so here are these people who have a lot of experience and they can you know give input uh, of course the young people have a lot of energy the young people are very good with technology the young people are very good with social media uh, but you've got older people who who understand who can see things from a you know a different perspective and so on and so forth so you've got to you know let people appreciate the generations appreciate uh, what each one is picking 
and so on. So uh, I think, uh, you know, intentionally creating teams where you bring ages together is an important thing, especially in a local church context, because that seems to be a problem that if you're not careful, uh, generations can be divided within the same congregation. But uh, these teams helps help in, uh, you know, uh, addressing that. Um, just some thoughts here on orientation, getting you um, volunteers. Uh, some of these things may be, you know, common knowledge, but uh, it's good just to go through it in a formal way. Uh, you know, uh, you introduce new volunteers to their teams, their team leaders, other team members as soon as possible. And usually we have uh, email group set up or WhatsApp group set up for various uh, teams so that there's communication happening. Uh, another important thing is to help volunteers, uh, you know, understand uh, organizational culture. So we'll next, maybe next week, uh, we have a chapter coming up on culture. Uh, so, uh, you know, we say, okay, hey, this is how we do things here, you know. Uh, this is a friendly environment, no competition here. We are working together. Um, we support each other. We encourage each other. Uh, so that culture has to be passed on to these new volunteers. They should understand that. Um, and uh, 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 some of it needs to be clearly stated during the orientation. And some of it, of course, uh, and everything has to be embodied by the other team members. Because uh, when newcomers will just follow what the other team members are doing. So if the other team members are working together, they are friendly, they are supportive, they're communicating, that's what they will also start doing. Um, uh, you know, uh, I remember at one time in the church, uh, again, uh, we'll deal with this when we talk about culture. But I began to notice cliques being formed in the church. Uh, and this was you know, among people in the volunteers. OK, if you are part of this volunteer team, you're like a super clique, you know, why? because you are doing something like that. And uh, now it's good to have uh, some sort of uh, team spirit and uh, camaraderie and all of that. But um, if it goes to the point of, hey, we are an elite group of people in church because we are doing this in church, then that is a no, no, you know, that's not good. And so we had to break that down, you know, hey, get rid of having this click mentality in church. No, of course, we have many different volunteer teams and every volunteer team is important. You know, whether you're, whether they are greeters or whether they are worship team members, hey, we're all equally special. So you got to be careful uh, to deal with those kinds of things in the culture and so on, right? And uh, the culture can also impact the experience, the volunteer experience. So for instance, uh, if you, know, you have a professional coming in to volunteer, but uh, if the way things are done is very unprofessional, like uh, then they are going to be turned off. Simple example is this. If you say, guys, all of the team, everybody show up at a certain time, right? Now, professionally, if you give a time, you expect everybody to be there on time. So, uh, but, you know, so this new person, uh, he comes on time, but he sees, you know, the rest of the team coming in 10 minutes late, 15 minutes late, it's going to put him off. See, I'm not coming back to this thing. These guys don't keep time. You know, they say this time they're coming 10 minutes late, 15 minutes late. So what's going to happen? You're going to lose the new volunteer. He's not going to come back. So it's a very simple thing. But that culture of keeping time must be there in everyone. So say, this time everybody shows up. And then what happens? Everybody's happy and that culture continues. It's reinforced. And new volunteers also begin to maintain that same culture. Right. So organizational culture is very important. Then uh, team policies and guidelines. So like, okay, this is what we do here. This is thing. So we have uh, a general uh, volunteer guidelines uh, that we have documented in this PDF um, and that's available uh, uh, as a sample. And uh, uh, and then and you can have a look at it. You can go to our guidelines page. Uh, that is uh, apcw.org slash guidelines. And, 
you can download it there. Um, now, in these voluntary guidelines, you know, so what has happened is, uh, especially in the initial years, uh, we used to have feedback from the congregation. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of it had to do with the conduct. For instance, I'll give a simple example. You know, worship team, they're on stage. They're leading worship. They lead for 45 minutes. They get off stage. And then months after that, they are loitering around during the rest of the service, right? They are going, maybe they go out for drinking water or using the washroom, but then they're sitting outside. The sermon is going on. And these are worship team people sitting outside chatting. Oh, that's a no-no. So what happened? Uh, uh, so that was one thing. And then when the sermon is over and the pastor says, worship team, come up. Hey, uh, guys are not around. So, you know, we had to wait for them all to get back into the auditorium and show up on stage because you were going to sing, you know, you're getting into ministry time. So then we decided we made some policies. We so say, hey, worship team members, after you finish worship, come and be seated on the front row, first row. You're all seated there. Uh, if you have to go to the restroom, go drink water, whatever, do it quickly, come back and sit on the first row. And the moment the pastor gives a cue saying, worship team, come up, within one minute, you have to be on stage. You know? Otherwise, what had happened was we were getting feedback from the congregation. Congregation saying, hey, those people were leading worship up on stage. Then they're sitting outside, not even listening to the sermon. I mean, what are they? Are they special people? What kind of an example is this? Uh, what kind of, you know, so congregation was giving feedback on based on this. And so we had to address it. And that's why we put these guidelines in place. You know, so I'm just giving, you know, so over time we've learned, you know, okay, for different groups, as we see, as we observe, as we get feedback from people, we have to put guidelines. Hey, guys, people are watching, be careful. And then, you know, a lot of the, at least here in Bangalore, a lot of the feedback was based on the attire of people who are on stage. Uh, sometimes we get feedback on the ushers. So what, what What kind of clothes are they wearing? People are very sensitive, you know. Now, we cannot control, you know, who wears what, but at least we set some general guidelines, you know, please, you know, the, we don't want to affect, uh, we don't want to affect people's, uh, you know, opinion about the church, you know, just dress modestly when you're up on stage, when you're being an usher, those kinds of things. So we had to put those things down because people giving feedback, they will tell straight away in your face, hey, what's happening? These are volunteers. Now, even though these people are volunteers, we still have to have these policies, these guidelines, because eventually it is impacting the whole con congregation. So like this, you know, we have to uh, be attentive, uh, be, be observant, uh, listen to what the congregation is saying, because we are serving them. And wherever we need, we up, update our policies and guidelines. And so that's how these things came into being. Um, the next part, of course, is uh, training volunteers. So uh, some teams are very simple. If you're a greeter, you stand and greet. Uh, it's very simple, shake hands or whatever, and give a nice smile, say welcome. But some teams do have a lot of training requirements. So uh, the worship teams, the setup team, the media presentation team, um, and other ministry areas, you know, when teams go on mission trips, when teams go on, you know, go to campuses for ministry and so on. So uh, different volunteer teams need to receive training based on, you know, what, uh, whatever they, they need. So obviously training improves performance, quality, keeps people motivated. Uh, and uh, we can also introduce changes when we have training. We can be excellent in our work. So, you know, we, we understand that. Uh, but it has to be thought out, uh, you know, think about what we need to give to our volunteers and keep the training simple and most efficient because volunteers can't come, you know, for three days to be trained. And, you know, they have one hour, they have two hours. So within that one, two hours, you've got to train them. So keep it simple, tailor it to just what is needed. Uh, don't tax them by saying, you know, come for 10 day training and all, then, then no volunteer will show up. Uh, we we'll lose the volunteers. So the training has to be very thoughtfully created uh, to make it very efficient because volunteers are giving a few hours and uh, they need to learn what they uh, what is essential. 
And then, of course, we give them opportunities where they can practice what they have learned without, you know, being threatened. Like they're afraid without being, um, you know, afraid that uh, while they are practicing, it may have a negative impact. No, let them practice. They'll gain confidence. Then they can get on uh, in, in in a live environment. Uh, just side notes here on you know there you can have uh, formal lecture training sessions, practical training, group discussions, coaching and mentoring. And so we do all of this, you know, so for children's church, um, uh, there's a training that's held every year before the start of the uh, the uh, the new sessions in June. Uh, it's a one it's a full day training. Uh, sometimes they make it interesting by having a off-site training to go away to a location and do a training. Uh, and so that includes a lot of practical things and so on. So different teams uh, train their people uh, differently. Uh, the worship team does uh, you know, special things they have between the course of the year and so on. And then team leaders who are people are leading the team, of course, will need extra training on how to you know, take care of their team how to take care for the people and uh, resolve conflicts, report on the status. So give them a little extra. Uh, just a little note here, just information. You know, we keep in mind that people learn differently. Some are visual, some auditory, some are practical. So uh, the training that provide, we provide must uh, accommodate people with their different learning types and so on. That's it. A um, few more thoughts here. Uh, when you're th thinking about volunteers, um, you know what, uh, you know what, really, how do we maximize uh, volunteer engagement? That means, you know, if you think about this, volunteers come with a lot of enthusiasm at the very beginning. You know, so it's like oh, I'm going to do something, going to help, come and say, okay, wonderful, wonderful. Now you know you want to, we want to maintain that enthusiasm and help them, you know, keep running the race. Now, uh, we don't want them to, you know, come with a huge amount of enthusiasm and then fizzle out quickly. You know, we don't want them to be like shooting stars. We just want to be, you know, we want to, we want to engage them and keep them engaged in those areas of ministries where they came to volunteer. So here are some thoughts on, you know, how do we do that? How do we maximize volunteer engagement in these different areas of ministries? How do we do that? So we need to understand some of the motivators for volunteers. So different people come with different motivation, motivate, more things that motivate them, right? Some people see it as an opportunity for kingdom work. So they're like purely there because, hey, I, I want to do something for God. I want to do something for uh, serving God. So this is an opportunity I can do, you know, so they look at it, you know, an opportunity to serve God. Uh, some people feel very connected to the vision, you know, so that that's their motivator. Wow, the church has a strong vision. Uh, I, I want to go on mission trips. I want to serve children. I want to serve the youth, uh, whatever, you know, they're connected to the vision of that area of ministry. That could be, a, that's a very, strong motivator. Uh, some people, uh, they're driven by a sense of contribution. I want to contribute. If I am able to give something towards the vision, that makes them feel motivated, right? So for them, the, the, the contribution aspect, you know, they, they should be given the opportunity to contribute. Uh, some come because, hey, it's uh, actually a growth and a learning for them. Uh, you know, I'd really like to learn new things. And if I volunteer in the media team, I'm going to learn how to handle, you know, cameras or I'm going to learn how to handle this software. And they enjoy learning new things. You know, so that could be a motivator for them. Uh, some, uh, they like to help in decision making. They have expertise as leaders and decision makers, and they would like to, you know, make a contribution in that sense. And uh, some uh, may even look at it as a potential for paid position. They see like, okay, look, if I do uh, a good job as a volunteer, maybe I can then become a staff in the church. And, you know, um, maybe uh, this may lead to uh, a, a, a ministry. So these are different 
more wages uh, for volunteers, right? So our goal is uh, we need to give them the opportunity. Right? Whatever whatever is motivated, different people have different, they, we're not saying everybody has the same thing, but we just try to list out some of the motivations. So what do we do? Give them the opportunity. Uh, let them contribute meaningfully the way they would like to, right? Or the way they can. Um, give them the opportunity to do that, create the opportunity and uh, some things to uh, uh, or keep in mind is uh, to maximize their engagement, don't burn them out. You know, uh, and this uh, has happened, uh, especially in our worship team and in our setup team uh, on Sunday. So that this is kind of almost like I would say, if you're not careful, uh, it just happens over and over again. Uh, that a few people are overworked and then they get burnt out and they never come back or they're like man i'm done with volunteering uh, i don't want any more of this you know so if we uh, while we understand their motivation which is genuine they really want to uh, we must also make sure we don't burn them out so that you know we maximize their engagement they get, that they can serve over time uh, if they need time out give them time out to relax. You know, they'll be away for a month or two and then come back. Um, so this scheduling rostering is important. Uh, our ultimate goal is, okay, let's maximize their engagement, so on, okay? Um, now, uh, another important thing, of course, is the use of software. Uh, we, uh, we will talk a little bit about that. Now, at APC, as of now, a lot of it is just done on spreadsheets and. Uh, things like that, but uh, we do have our church management system, uh, which uh, has the you know uh, potential to manage volunteer teams, but we haven't opened it out yet. Uh, uh, but you know we will uh, we'll talk about it. We'll mention it later later on. A, a few more things of importance before we close on this is uh, staff. The relationship between volunteers and staff. Again, this is a very critical area. So we have staff who are, uh, you know, full-time with the church or a Christian organization. Then you have volunteers and uh, they have to work together. And uh, if they don't, uh, if they're not able to work together, it's going to break down everything. Nothing will get done. So this volunteer staff relations is critical. It's, 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 it's highly important uh, for the ministry, ministry, the church or Christian organization. That so uh, staff should understand and volunteers, and you know, and and, and at APC, I think uh, for the most part, this has worked out well. Thank God for that. Uh, the staff and the volunteers have uh, worked out well. At times, we've had to you know work through certain things, but for the most part. Our church staff uh, have, you know, have a good working relationship with volunteers. Uh, we've had some challenges, and maybe I will share some learning from that. But most of it has been good. Uh, staff and volunteers should treat each other with trust, respect, and celebrate each other. So uh, this is something. This is again part of the culture. We will talk about culture later, but as a culture, we should say, hey, like, you know, there are staff, there are volunteers, treat each other with respect, trust, and celebrate each other. You know, we're not competing with each other. We're not against each other. We have to work uh, as a team in harmony, uh, in camaraderie. So that is important. Uh, another important thing uh, in to building a good relationship is communication, perhaps the most important thing. A lot of the breakdown happens when there is no communication or it's not happening properly. Then there's a breakdown between staff and volunteers, right? So if the volunteers are well-informed and can communicate, they feel satisfied uh, with the organization. So, you know, the free communication, meaningful, transparent between staff and volunteers really keeps people together. But like I said, we've had our set of challenges. So the thing is, uh, we need to recognize, hey, something is not going good between volunteers and staff. Um, you know, things are not working out. 
uh, certain ministry areas, things are not working out. Okay, we need to address it. So what are some symptoms? You know, how can you pick it up, pick up that, uh, look, things are breaking down. Here's just a small list. I'm not saying uh, uh, this is complete, but uh, one is, this is very basic. Uh, if volunteer staff don't know who's responsible for what, it's going to result in misunderstandings. So that's why in the very beginning, for every three team, uh, the roles and responsibilities must be very clear. Okay, this people are doing this. Staff will do this, volunteers should do that. And okay, volunteers, you're handling the book table, but it is a staff's responsibility to bring the books to the venue. The volunteers can't do it because you know during the week they are uh, away. So the volunteer needs to inform the office, office, church office. Church office must make sure that some staff will bring the books uh, the stock of books to the venue, keep it there. Volunteers are not responsible for it. So that, you know, simple example, the, the roles have to be very clearly stated. But when there is this, you know, uh, uncertainty about that, then it's a break. breakdown happens. Uh, when you see people being uncooperative, you know, uh, on pr things that have to be done together, like, hey, they're not really working together. Okay, that means there's a breakdown. It's not happening. Um, when they're not welcoming each other's ideas and suggestions, that's again a breakdown. When they're having their own separate meetings, <laughs> volunteers are meeting, having their own meeting, staff are having their own meeting, but they're supposed to be part of the same team, then you know <laughs> something is wrong. It's not, it's not happening. Uh, these two people, I mean, these two groups, uh, they're supposed to be together, but they're having their own meetings separately and deciding things on their own. Uh, it's a sign that things are broken down. If there's no, it, again, you know, it's connected. If they're not sharing information, it's a sign that things are broken down. Uh, if they're not communicating directly, but they're going around each other, you know. So, uh, anyway, um, you know, uh, then you know that, hey, things are not working out, working well here. You know, they're not talking with each other. They're going around somewhere, talking to some third person to find out what is happening. Uh, then uh, it's a problem. Uh, then when you listen to them, you know, they're using us and them. You know, staff is saying they are the cause of the problem. Volunteers are saying staff is not doing their job. So it's, it becomes an us and them battle. Uh, when you hear that kind of language, then, okay, you know, something is broken down. Uh, and then... Uh, also when they carve out their own territory, you know, so volunteers say, staff don't come here, this is, we are doing this. Staff says, don't come here, we are doing this. And, you know, they're not working together. So uh, these, the, you know, these are just symptoms, you know, when you see these things, you know, something is wrong. Staff and volunteers are not working together. What do you do? Well, you've got to check up. You've got to immediately address the problem. So you get them together check out, find out what is wrong, what's causing the problem, and, uh, you know, we, how do we resolve it? So there have been times we've had to sit down, you know, call everybody together and say, guys, this didn't work out. What went wrong? You know, okay, we have staff, we have volunteers, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, at this event, there was uh, things didn't work out. What went wrong. So we've had to do those kinds of things. Um, and even then we'll find that, you know, the volunteers said the staff was supposed to do it and the staff said volunteers were supposed to do it. And, you know, there was a breakdown in communication or, you know, this it was um, relationship issues, so on. But then we have to resolve those things so that, uh, because if staff and volunteers don't work together, ministry is not going to happen. People who are the congregation, people who are coming to the event, they are not going to get the benefit. So, um, you know, as soon as you see some problems, uh, do an assessment, check up, find out what is wrong. You know, best, simplest thing is to get everybody together in a, in a team meeting. Let everybody talk together, clear the air, find out what is wrong and say, okay, you know, this is what we need to do differently to make sure these problems don't happen. But I, this is a very important part of uh, volunteer management.
Last few things, uh, you know, just like we have uh, church staff performance management for volunteers, uh, we need to evaluate what is happening. We need to give them feedback. Uh, we need to bring in some guidance and correction uh, has to happen. So for example, worship team, they would do this immediately after every worship session, worship service. They will get together. They will talk again. What went, what, what went well, or didn't, whatever. They have the immediate uh, at the end of the worship service. It's like a feedback, self evaluation. Uh, so they review and they check. Similarly, so we have team leaders responsible for this. You know, team leaders should take charge of their team, evaluate what's going on, give feedback, uh, make sure standards are being maintained, policies are followed. Uh, if there's any correction, bring correction. But that performance management must happen either in formal team meetings or on a ad hoc, as and when review meetings needs to happen. And if volunteers are not doing their job, uh, well, uh, same thing happens. You know, we just release them and say, hey, thank you very much. But, uh, you know, uh, if you're not able to uh, fulfill the requirements, it's okay. You know, we release them from being volunteers. Another thing that we do is uh, every year, and we've been doing this for many years now, uh, once a year we have an volunteer appreciation day uh, where uh, 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 once a year we take time to get all our volunteers together, invite them uh, for a special day. Uh, we give lunch, we have lunch together, we make it a fun event, say thank you, and then we try to give them one nice gift that just to appreciate them for their work the previous year. Um, so, uh, of course, the last two years we haven't done it, but prior to that, you know, once a year we would just appreciate them, thank them, uh, and uh, give them some 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 gift as a token of saying thank you for serving. So it's a way of appreciating and thanking them. It also motivates people to get involved and be part of it. Now, uh, last couple, two things, uh, which is more new, uh, which is uh, one is we can have people volunteer remotely. Uh, so, uh, especially in the during the last two years, uh, what we realized is, hey, people, you know, people are forced to work from home. They can be a part of the team, and so you know, right now, we actually have uh, people both uh, as consultants and as volunteers, uh, you know, doing things from wherever they are. So, you know, there are certain things that can be done uh, remotely. And so uh, uh, we, we are doing that. And I think that can be an ongoing thing. People can volunteer remotely from anywhere in the world for certain things that happen in church and ministry. And um, uh, lastly, when we talk about cross-cultural volunteers, I mean, when people are coming from a different culture, we need to sensitize them to the local culture. So when our mission teams go across into other parts of the country, we usually sensitize them. Hey, uh, you know, make sure you dress according to the local culture. Make sure you behave certain way. Uh, don't do these things. So when they go on mission trips, uh, we want to be sensitive to the culture in which they are going uh, to serve uh, and all of those kinds of things. So that also needs to be taken care of. All right. So. Uh, this is a quick uh, run through on volunteer management. I uh, hope uh, I've tried to cover a lot of different thoughts and ideas. But uh, yeah, so uh, we have some time now. Uh, we take the uh, next uh, six to 10 minutes to uh, just share ideas, thoughts, questions, anything on volunteer management. Uh, Pastor, a small question. Yes, so, uh, this regards to uh, volunteer cross training. Mm. So, is it good to have cross training for the volunteers, or will it affect the reason? I'm say, uh, you know, just for an example, you know, people in the worship team or people in the ushering team, so they are very comfortable. Okay, so this is my space, this is my area, and I know, uh, you know, be it uh, other other areas, so it's not pertinent for me. So, uh, you know. So saying that, you know, so we uh, from our side, like, you know, from ch church side or the from the administration side saying that, hey, let's step, uh, take a step ahead and know what's happening in the other side, other teams as well. So will it by making mandatory the cross training, will it affect the volunteers, uh, Pastor? Just a question. Mm -hmm. 
See, um, uh, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, one is, uh, it is a positive thing, right? It is very positive, especially, you know, for one team to know, hey, what's going on in the other. But it doesn't have to, I mean, uh, to cross train may also mean that uh, they need to have certain skills, which they may not have. But what, so I think we can do it in a, a lesser way, which is just to inform them. You know, rather than say, for example, like as you said, uh, set up team, worship team. Now, people in set up team may not have the kind of skills that are needed for, or the knowledge that is needed for worship team. So we can't put them there. But what we can do is we can expose them to, you know, what's going on in the other teams. Like just maybe, you know, a, a 30 minute talk or a presentation saying, hey, or just do a lunch together. Uh, with these two teams uh, and then uh, let somebody from worship team just share like hey th these are the things that we do this is you know how you know a person comes prepared to lead worship you know then the week during the week we spend this is how we practice and this is how we prepare our songs and this is how we come so then the setup team are oh you know these guys just don't wake up and roll out of bed and roll into church <laughs> they have to you know do all this preparation before they show up in church yeah so i better make sure that you know i do my job well to support them or uh, the worship team members may share some of the challenges while they're on stage like if i don't hear the sound you know uh, kind of thing so so that i think just that in kind of interaction maybe in an informal way uh, serves this purpose of getting both teams to see the other side, understand and appreciate each other. And uh, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Makes sense, Pastor. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good question. Yeah. Any other uh, thoughts, questions? Yeah. So I think uh, uh, to sum up everything, if we have good, uh, uh, good, I mean, if we have a very enthusiastic volunteer base, uh, and uh, if we engage them well, and you know, and if we can get a really good relationship, really good uh, uh, interactions between staff and volunteers, uh, you know, the whole church or uh, organization will be really good. You know, uh, everybody enjoys working. Uh, the output will be great, and uh, you know, uh, ministry will really thrive. But it has to be, uh, what to say, managed well. You know, uh, we have to take care of both sides, the staff and the volunteers. And if if things are done very well, uh, it'll be a big big blessing to the congregation or the organization. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, so next week we will talk about communications. Uh, I think for communication, we'll just do one, one hour, one lecture. After communications, we're gonna talk about culture. Now, culture is very important. So we'll probably spend uh, two lectures on that. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's it. Let's uh, wrap up. Let's uh, close in prayer. Uh, if there are no more questions, um, who wants to pray? Samuel, why don't you pray and we'll dismiss, please. Okay, we can't hear Samuel. Oh, okay. Check. Hello, Pastor, can you hear? Ah, oh, no, we can hear. Go ahead, please. Okay. <coughs> Precious Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. Father, we commit to all of us who have come together for this class. Lord, everything that we have learned in regards to Lord and every other aspects, Lord, we especially ask of your grace and mercy, Lord, uh, to do, do it in a right way that you would expect out of us, O oh Lord Jesus. Everything that we learn through this class, help us to put it into practice. And also, Lord, uh, uh, as we go through this class, help us to understand. And we give you all the glory, honor, power, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, everyone. Thank you.
have a good uh, afternoon. Enjoy you, your boss. weekend. God bless yes. you all next week. Bye now. Bye. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye now.